Thank you for joining us. We have Kit and Jordan here today talking about how not to get burned in the year of the dragon. All right, take it away, guys. Hello. Hello. The year of the dragon starts in two days, February 10th. So good timing on the webcast title. I appreciate that, Ken. Yeah, absolutely. So we want to talk today about um, what we've seen in the last year uh, at BHIS with our engagements and what we've found has led to compromise. So that's kind of what I'm talking about today. And we're going to expand on it a little bit from what we observed to helping organizations prevent the attacks in the year of the dragon, which starts in two days. Two days. All right, let's get started. So I stole this agenda slide from Gabriel. So thanks, Gabe. We appreciate it. Keep it, keep it simple. Uh, basically, this is what we're going to do. We're going to explain to you why this talk, why it matters to you, why it matters to us, why you should care, and then give the talk. That's it. Yeah, that's it. Exactly. So let's go on more about why this talk. So like I said, uh, we looked essentially at uh, our data from last year. And BHS, if, if you're not familiar with us, we do penetration testing, multiple different types of penetration testing. Uh, Jordan and I had the opportunity to data mine some of our reports uh, and pull out some interesting information. So in this process, you know, we kind of tried to do something similar to uh, those who might be familiar with the uh, Verizon cybersecurity report that has always come out. Um, it's always been a lengthy report. It's always been um, very interesting. We've often, oftentimes referenced it for the data that's within it. Uh, but, you know, the quantified analysis there has always been, how does this apply to, you know, a target audience? Now, we don't really know. Um, and that's kind of why we wanted to take this opportunity to do something similar where we knew what the target audience was and what the actual data, where the actual data came from. So we know who the data comes from. Um, it's from, been from our customers. And uh, essentially, we know what led to a compromise in those environments. So that's kind of what we're going to talk about today. Now, we're going to talk about a little bit um, about how we approached that data, how we analyzed it, and then we're going to get into the actual meat of that data. And the result of that meet is going to produce some defensive technologies and defensive mechanisms that actually mitigate risks that led to the compromises. So this is kind of like the Verizon data breach report. I like that analogy, except that we have uh, much closer ties to the data we're analyzing. If we go back in time a little bit, do you remember what year Brad got hired? as an intern three years ago. Maybe. So three or four years ago when we hired Brad, his first job, one of his very first jobs as an intern was to manually go through our reports. And at that time we were only looking at 500, maybe 600. We've done about 16 to 20% growth every year. So at this point we're looking at seven to 800 and uh, we've, been, we've been improving our data mining of these reports over time as well. Now, those of you that have watched us Often, you'll notice that we did a, um, a similar presentation in 2022, uh, and it was it was similar in nature that we we focused on some of the um, things that we knew would lead to compromise, but really wasn't quantified in any specific way. We it was just kind of our observations over time and our our subjective feelings about it. And in this case, we actually have objective data to back it up. So that's kind of what's different here. But really, this is going to be talking about we know organizations are getting burned and we wanted to talk about why and what can be done to, to limit some of that, that potential um, risk. And this is our EPS slide. So if you don't know what the EPS acronym is to us, it's our executive problem statement. And what that means is basically we want to make sure that we address a central theme in the content we provide. And so here we're saying everyone eventually gets burned, right? Can't everyone goes down in flames. Basically, the question is, how can we limit that damage? Uh, how can we improve our detection capacity? How can we move down that mean time to detection? How can we reduce that collateral damage, basically? And, and the great part is, you know, we say everyone gets burned. You can say, well, my, my organization won't. And um, it will, but it comes down to, like, how well did you limit that damage? Because you can limit the damage to the point that, you know, the burning was pretty much nothing, or it can completely destroy your organization, or it might make your stock go up if you follow too much of that stuff. So let's talk a little bit about um, the data set that we have and, and kind of what we did with it. So we looked at the engagements from 2023 at BHIS. I, I can't remember the exact number, but I think we ended up with about 1,700 um, files that we were looking at. We needed to reduce that. We had some duplicates in there that just the nature of how BHS processes our data and deliver makes deliverables for our customers. 
we had some uh, some duplicates. So we had to filter those down. Uh, we got down to what was essentially um, 750 reports. Now, those reports were multiple engagements. So those 750 reports had more than 750 engagements. Some of the reports had 13 plus engagements on it, so it's a lot sometimes. Uh, but the point is, we then looked at that and we pulled out all the stuff that essentially was called out as a vulnerability or risk we're finding inside that report. Now, if you're not familiar with how BHS reports work, um, essentially we come in, we can do a penetration test, and our report is kind of divvied up into multiple sections. We have the executive summary section that's really for um, executive level. We've got a findings matrix that's really for practitioner, really for leadership. And then lastly, methodology, which is detailed and, and essentially is a roadmap to reproducing our same results. Um, and that's for practitioners. So we focused on that middle section, the leadership, which was our uh, highlighting of those vulnerabilities. And once we did that, we started looking at all those types of vulnerabilities we had and tried to figure out which ones had led to a, a essentially an assumed uh, adversarial virtualized compromise, right? Because we're, we're adversarial when we do pen tests, but we're not necessarily actually going to destroy your network. That's not our intention. Our intention is to find those vulnerabilities. So we had to look into that data and figure out which ones actually would have led to a potential burning or a compromise. Uh, a little bit more about the PowerShell PNP logic here. If you haven't seen PowerShell PMP, it is a plugin for PowerShell that allows you to interact with SharePoint and those kind of uh, online data and folder repositories. And it's really nice in that, like I, we say here, we're gonna iterate through folders, we're gonna identify items that match our criteria, and then we're gonna do some additional parsing and downloading of the files we're interested in. So it's, it's a really cool tool if you haven't seen it. So I talked a little bit um, about how those how our report looks at BHIS. Uh, we wanted to dive in a little bit more to about those risk categories. So when you have a report from BHIS from pen testing activity, um, we take those those vulnerabilities and we we apply a typically um, it's both subjective and objective risk rating to it. We try to take the the implied risk that comes with a vulnerability and apply it to what it looks like in your environment based off the information we have. So based off that, we've got critical, high, medium, and low findings. Um, there's a little bit of information there, but essentially they're, they're kind of self-evident. Critical typically means it's, you know, you, you push something over and you have access. Uh, whereas high might require a little bit more effort. Medium can usually give a sense of information, but not necessarily lead to a full compromise. And low are things that take a lot of work to get working. Uh, and then lastly, informational, which is just, just like that informational. So we, we took that into account as we data mined through uh, and then we realized that we needed to kind of weight our data. And the reason we needed to do that was because we were seeing that some of our medium findings were seen so often in our reporting uh, that they, they looked like they were more important than they actually were. So an example that we can give of that is, is one that Jordan and I both, you know, we, we both talk about all the time, and that is uh, SSL and TLS certification errors um, or weeks uh, SSL, or sorry, TLS Cypher suites being enabled on a web server or any other um, open SSL based um, service. And you look at that and you say, you should probably fix this. And we call it a medium. And if you were to do that same thing in Nessus, Nessus will actually call it a higher critical. And we always kind of chuckle about it because we, we understand why it's there. It's about the fact that it's encryption and the nature of encryption <laughs> should be that um, it's, it's kind of absolute. It's either um, weak or it's not. And if it's not weak, then great. But if it's weak, then it's clearly a higher critical finding. Um, and, and trying to relate that in a business setting, you know, if you have CBC ciphers enabled, maybe maybe go through the process sometime soon to start deprecating those off your systems, but it's not the end of the world. And it's very unlikely that that's going to lead to a full on compromise. Side question here. When was the last time you compromised something SSL or TLS related? Not hardly which was five years ago, yeah. seven years ago, maybe. Yeah. Now, don't get me wrong. It, it's legitimate risk. If someone had enough data, enough machine in the middle data and enough compute power, they will, in theory, be able to break some of that, that encryption and be able to read that communication that was supposed to be encrypted or was encrypted. Uh, but you kind of have to ask, you know, what level of adversary you're talking about there. So um, let me talk about our waiting here real quick because we got a good question. And then I've got another side note to mention. We are putting our risk categories here on the screen. Basically, all we did to weight them was one point for low, two points for medium, three points for high, four points for critical. This resulted in a pretty accurate representation. And remember, there's biases involved. So we threw out things that are useless in the path of compromise. Like 
Ken has mentioned CBC ciphers. We report SSH CBC ciphers all the time as medium, but they're not really in that chain of compromise. Now, one more thing. We called John between four and six times for this webcast because I'm asking the question, John, are we giving away our secret sauce here? Are we telling how we're risk categorizing? Is that secret sauce? Absolutely not. Are we giving away information that someone might take and make money off of? Sure, but not our problem. We want to share. We want to make the world a better place. So the number of times John had to approve things that went into this slide deck is as high as any of we have produced. So there's that. All right. So let's talk a little bit about here. Um, oh, yeah. Can we go back one more? Oh, yeah, and we're going to introduce characters. We've got some characters. Kat has found this clip art. This is Tanvi. She's available in the Microsoft clip art as you know free image and free use. So there's a bunch of pictures you might see throughout. These are characters we use from the Microsoft clip art galleries as part of our licensing. So this is Tanvi. We need to put a little name tags. We do. So, I thought about that too, yeah. And the next one is Rachel. This is Rachel. Rachel is not impressed. She's not impressed at all. So uh, there is a little overlap here from 2022. Um, we kind of talked about that and it, it's interesting. We'll talk a little bit about deltas in, at the end of the, the talk, but yeah, um, let's let's dig into it, and uh, yeah, let's let's just kick off. We have one thing we want to mention. And this is trademarked, by the way. So <laughs> you can you you can use this too, but it's trademarked. Yeah, we actually had someone reach out and said, "Hey, can we use some screenshots of your slide deck?" Whatever, it's fine. Um, so honorable mention. Uh, this is not so much risk, but it could be a risk, and that is if you don't have the optics, you have a problem. Um, we have organizations that go with us that we have a red team and they are on it immediately, like very, very quickly. And it's like, wow, that's really good. Um, we have other organizations that will do an internal pen test, um, which is very, very noisy in a network. Like exceptionally, we make no vulnerability scans yeah, it's and loud. credential smashing and everything else we can come up with. Remote lots credential of access. Lots yes. of logs. And we say, did you see anything? And they say, no, we didn't see you do anything. Like, what did you for, do? Yeah. Um, so that's an indication that maybe you need to work on those optics. And those optics are, you know, if you think about it from like the the, old, the SIM stack, right? Making sure that you have a, a valid SIM, make sure you have your, your appropriate logs going into that SIM, make sure that's actually operational, that you can use it, that you can search in it. So we see that full spectrum. We have organizations that that really are completely blind and others that are very, very on top of it. Um, and, you know, full visibility, you can't get there. It's a bell curve. It's way to the right. You can't get there. Um, you can definitely be completely blind, though, for the most part. Yeah. So kind of moving on from that, um, talking a little bit more about threat optics. There's some interesting statistics we found when we were doing some research. Uh, the the average ransomware breach is is quite expensive still. Um, and globally, $5 million, Yeah. U.S., $9 million. I wonder so what that economy looks like, how much that economy is worth. Anyways, if you haven't seen traffic on Hulu, the, the money game is insane. All right. Uh, detection time still pretty high. Uh, you know, we've BHS does have an active SOC, so they're they're getting that down really good for their customers. And it's pretty awesome. Um, I'm sure you, you're probably aware of that. If not, check out the other webcasts on it. But it's very interesting. Containment of breach down to 73 days. Um, we say down because obviously this used to be a lot more and it's it is trending down, but it needs to trend down more quickly, I think. The issue is that organizations are still failing to detect um, the actual bad parts. So we can say, like, if you're not catching a pen test, especially if it's an internal, it's very noisy, that's a problem. But if you're not, you know, an adversary in your environment is not going to look like an internal pen test in terms of logging at all. It can be much, much more complex, generally speaking. All right. So... We're now we're gonna get into the, the actual meat of our analysis. So the following risks, they represent the common attack vectors that yielded simulated adversarial compromise in 2023. So these are things that through our data mining and analysis, these were the ones that led and to biases, compromise. Right? Yeah. We're gonna keep mentioning study biases because they are inherent in almost all studies and we have done our best to describe our biases when they show up. So this first one, Information linkage.
Hi, everyone. Confirm. Thank you very much. Still with us. OK. Excellent. That was really strange. <laughs> well, we might have gotten booted for a second. Yeah, all right. we all might have. So let me let me give a shout out to Corey and the effort our CPT team has done on ingesting this type of data. We now really we, we look at it for every test type we perform. That includes, you know, whether it's a web application, we're going to go run a breach data analysis, whether it's an internal pen test, I'm going to go see if you have data out in Steeler logs, you're hosting uh, some interesting thing in the cloud. Guess what? We're going to dig through any of this information leakage that may have occurred in the past. Basically, at this point, it seems to us that everyone's been compromised. If we go look at, say you're hosting a application that has customers log in, create accounts, we now go check for that host record in our data sets and see if those hosts may have been compromised through these Steeler logs. If you're not familiar with the Steeler logs, this is something you want to go look into. I think a government agency somewhere is probably trying to make a search engine available for it. And it, it's really an ugly, ugly data set. So it's kind of a, a ticking, I wouldn't call it, I don't like the word time bomb in this, but it, it is definitely a race against adversaries finding valid credentials in the Steeler logs data. So it's something not to ignore, hard to parse, and a challenge to address. It, it is super awkward when we search for Steeler logs for one customer and we find related to that customer uh, data from one of our other customers in those same logs. It's kind of kind of interesting. So, yeah. Um, I don't know how much, uh, we don't know how much you guys, uh, how long we cut out for. So hopefully it wasn't too long. Uh, we'll, we'll have to, you'll check it on the recording if it was, I guess. Oh, and let's, let's one more thing here. Yeah. We, we have a bullet point in here about your browser data. Your parents probably click to save passwords in the browser. Your people at your companies probably do. When those get compromised, those get yanked, shipped, and then stored for future use. So storing passwords in a browser is a terrible idea because those are available through the DP API and Windows. There's just a lot of risks with doing this. Yeah, don't store passwords in the browser ever. All right, so talk a little bit about that. I mean, we've got this huge data set that we can leverage, but how that data got there is one thing. But how do you deal with that once it's there? And, you know, obviously the big one is if there's passwords in there, which there will be, um, you want to make sure that you roll those passwords all the time. And there was, you know, there is this case uh, a few years ago where people said, well, if we have long passwords, we don't need to rotate our passwords, right? That was that was the this idea that if the password is long enough, we go back to that NIST document that like said you had to roll rotate passwords as the password could be compromised based off brute force. And then getting to now where, yes, mathematically speaking, that's not necessary. But now the concern is what happens when one of those passwords gets breached in one of these Steeler locks or somewhere else. And that's what we need to account for. So your 30 character password needs to be rotated if it ended up in a Steeler lock or if it ended up compromised in any capacity. And that's why we still need to be rotating those passwords. Strong password policy is huge. Yeah. Uh, password policy needs to define out things like word lists and that type of stuff. 25% 20, of our reports had this. That's, yeah. that's about what my math says. 25%, you had some exposure. And this, this may have led downstream to additional things. And then it would have been reported as a high or reported under credential stuffing or password reuse or some other vulnerability we identified and finally we reported. So 15 years ago, too, organizations tried to really lock down, and I know some still do, but really tried to lock down internet usage within their organizations so that if you're at work, you can only do things for work. And we do mention on here not to mix home and work. And what that's really talking about is that personal and work balance in terms of using like, for example, a single device for both. Now, this is really difficult if you think about cell phones with BYOD, um, how are you managing that? Do you have you know an MDM process on that that's actually watching it closely? And then more to the fact of, if you have an organization that does issue laptops, you know, are you are you monitoring that? Um, not just from the perspective of you issuing a laptop and they can do whatever they want on it because they're getting their work done, but more to the fact of could you issue a laptop and then, oh man, log into uh, either like a VPN or log into an RDP service that gets them to their actual applications they need to use. More difficult, right, and more costly, but there is a level of defense there too. Yeah. 
Something I tell customers about that one is that policy bullet point that says, define services you want your mail domains registered on. When we started at BHIS eight, 10 years ago, whenever that was, Twitter was one of those things. So I registered my Twitter account. And then defining what's allowed is easier than defining what's not allowed. Speaking of defining what's allowed, excellent segue. <laughs> Access to administrative utilities. So uh, one of the... Uh, and, uh, one of the tests that we do at BHIS, um, we have a couple there, pivot and assume compromise. Uh, and then we do some C2 testing, which is essentially going through a device or a workstation or an image and defining out the different pathways, the different vectors that can be used to either create a command and control channel and also to pivot from that, from that device and that user account into other things. One of the common findings we have from that is we can still do things like open up the Microsoft Store on those devices and install things like Python, right, without administrative credential. Or, you know, we might have PowerShell scripts blocked, but then we can open up PowerShell ISE and run a script in PowerShell ISE without saving it, which then just runs in memory. And these are things that you might be thinking like, okay, well, yes, now I need to go block PowerShell. Maybe, you know, think about it from the perspective of, does your accounting department need PowerShell? Does your accounting department need Python? And don't get me wrong, if you're working in like, I don't know, um, crypto or something, maybe you've got some amazing scripts that are doing it, maybe. But generally speaking, no, they won't, okay? And it's not just those. I mean, it's the command line. It's things like WScript. It's things um, that essentially allow you to run code on a Windows system or really any system. But in, specifically with Microsoft, allow you to run malicious code on Microsoft Windows using a signed Microsoft binary. So when it runs, the ADP or the, you know, the, um, the EDR platforms you have look and be like, well, this is Microsoft running something. It's signed code. It's safe. It's not always the case. And, and um, AV is definitely getting better at that, identifying that type of stuff, but it's still concerning. Yeah. Uh, PowerShell version 2 is still on systems, PowerShell version 5. The, as Kent mentioned, the Microsoft Store allows you to install PowerShell version 7, which runs as PWSH, which doesn't match all rules, does not maybe allow the same AMC hooks as other things. If you add it after the fact, does your EDR product still insert a DLL into the running process? Who knows? So take note, there's risks. This was commonly reported and at default is vulnerable. If you're uh, Windows 11 or server, make sure you uh, remove the SSH features. Uh, you don't want the OpenSSL SSH client installed. All right, so how do you deal with this? Um, there's a couple of great comments actually I've seen uh, in chat here. One of them was our back. So you can go through and it's exactly what we're talking about. Um, in an organization, you know, you really want your access to any resource, any resource to be job functional based, right? So I kind of mentioned accounting. Let's compare accounting to a uh, different department. I'll say like facilities that has to manage um, heating and cooling, right? Two different departments, their jobs are significantly different and the tools that they need to use are also different. And because of that, you can start building these profiles around each one and then assign those profiles to groups and those groups essentially to resources. In terms of Active Directory, we could, I could go on for hours on Active Directory, but use RBAC. Um, don't assign users to resources. Don't like share a folder to a user, share it to a group, but that's for another day. This specifically, RBAC could address this. We could talk about App Locker here, um, more, more generally application control, but then assign that application control to RBAC, to a group, so that, yeah, you can, you can apply it to different user groups that might need to use these mm -hmm. tools. And then definitely go through the process of hardening PowerShell. You know, it's not just maybe enough to block PowerShell, but also block the capability to run scripts and, you know, unsigned code, that type of thing. And when we say remove SSH from Windows, I'm saying be careful with SSH on Windows. The SSH client can be re basically used as a we C2 should, channel. We should go back. So it is this slide. Yeah. Um, one of the great things that we like to do now, um, if you have the SSH client, specifically the open SSL um, SSH client that's in Windows natively now, um, you essentially make an outbound SSH connection using a remote proxy, and that allows that remote connection to have access to your internal network through that outbound SSH connection. So then you can talk about, okay, let's not use S uh, SSH, let's not have that open, SS open SSL SSH client on Windows, but then also let's talk about that network connectivity. Why do you have this system making outbound SSH connection to anywhere? Not just port 22, any port SSH protocol, which means you need to do protocol level inspection. All right, 
Next one up. Weak pass from policy. So we had an interesting chat actually yesterday, um, internal at BHIS, and it was um, one of my, we did a password spray, which is we essentially take all the user accounts and we try a single password across all of them. Um, and then we do that at a timed rate such that we don't lock out accounts. Uh, and we've really, really good luck with winter 2024 explanation points and you know winter 2023 explanation point. Um, if you have old passwords, what you can do is you can look at the, the last time the password was set for a user account and then uh, use a password that was that season with year explanation point. Uh, so one of the, the questions I got asked internally is, well, I've got a password that I password sprayed. It is technically compliant with the password policy. It is complex. It is, you know, so many characters long, but I was able to guess it. And it's like, well, then you you still have a weak password policy, right? You're, you're, you were still allowing a weak password. And, you know, we talk about at BHIS, you need to get to at least 15 characters in length. That's a lot. I mean, it is. But the key thing there is 15 characters, but you still have to rotate your passwords. Why? Because of stealer logs, because that password could still be compromised and reused because country credential stuffing. And it still might crack because of the quality of our dictionary lists at this point, the quality of our adversarial dictionary lists. It's a tough business to be in now. If you're not pushing phrases and you're not pushing education and you're not using filter lists of known compromised passwords, somebody is going to find a way to use a terrible password and it will get burned. Eventually. So, uh, D for Jesse, winner 2024, winner 2024 explanation point is a fantastic password to have on a word list. Um, and it will absolutely get used. And I can say that with, with fact, it is going to be used. Um, and that's an interesting one because it, it is 20 characters, like you said, and it's complex. It meets all the requirements except for the word had a, a word that was a season, um, which then brings me to the, the question of correct first battery staple is a terrible password. Well, okay. Yeah, it's, it's, it's on a comic and everybody knows the comic and we joke about it and we use it as reference material all the time to create better passwords. But the reality of it is, um, if you look at the English frequency of those words, it's actually not that high. So yeah, we're removing our key space from, you know, 50, 60 characters to words, numbers of words, but at only five words and 10,000 words is 10,000 to the fifth, which is a big number. But when you're cracking passwords at, you know, trillions per second, it's not that big, right? All right. So as mentioned in the chat, use Microsoft Entra's password filter lists. It used to be AAD filtering or Azure Active Directory. They now call it Entra. They're going to keep changing things over time, but ultimately find a password filter list that works for you. There's third-party solutions for this. Put it on your Active Directory servers, your, your domain controllers. Install this in Active Directory in the cloud if you're using it there. I'm guessing Amazon has something for their directory services. Basically, do better because right now, all the passwords you've ever used have the potential of already being compromised. Use a password manager instead, randomize everything, make it complicated, make everything MFA. Stop reusing passwords. This is a really, really cheesy one that we have to say so consistently, but I don't know. What's the number of test suite credential stuffed reused passwords on? Too many? Yeah. Is one enough? Is it 50? It's it's too many, however we look at this. So I do have a small rant here. Um, I was uh, watching the Twitters, the X, whatever it is. Um, Troy Hunt yesterday had uh, an, uh, an interesting thing. We're still good? My screen popped up, so I'm like sure we're still live here. Um, so Troy Hunt had something uh, on Twitter. Essentially, it was a discussion about uh, the computational effectiveness of password hashes. And it got me thinking because in the back of my head, you know, at BHIS, I'm one of the administrators for Hashcat. We've got a couple of password crackers um, and Hashcat does not crack passwords. Um, it's literally concatenation of a hash. Um, it does hash collisions. Right. Um, and your pot file is not a pot. It's a list of potentials because it's creating hash collisions. Um, I always get I always see like, oh, yeah, put it in the pot. It's, like it's not it's not a pot it's a yeah. list of potentials um, where they'll say crack passwords i'm even trying to get away in our reports from writing we cracked a password because we didn't crack a password we found a hash collision right those are different things anyways enough of that rant um so cultural friction is tough yeah when when the security team walks into a boardroom and says we need to improve our password policy executives look and say there's no way that's that's never going to happen here so until we're able to communicate more clearly that length is more important than complexity that you can keep your passwords for longer if you learn to use phrases 
implementing filter lists is probably a good idea. All of those things improve your password policy. And it's a better argument to make in a boardroom than we need to improve our password policy by making it longer. Yeah. And, you know, from the, the technical aspects of that, you know, use uh, word filters. So you remove out seasons, you move out anything that looks like your organization's name, your street address, your phone numbers, put all those inside that password filter. And the net result of that is you'll you'll eventually get employees, hopefully creating stronger passwords. But, you know, eventually they'll, they're still going to come up with some that are maybe not. So, so Zerker would like you to clarify. Yes. Uh, I believe the statement here is hash collision is ex extremely rare. Yes. Unless using SHA-1 okay. or MD5. So, oh, hang okay. on. Okay. Okay. Hey, hang on. I got it. I got... <laughs> okay. You're right. You're right. Um, hash collision is technically two different hashes meeting to the same result. Um, hash collision is also the same hash, same hash, or sorry, same cipher being, or same um, key being uh, hashed getting to the same result. So technically you're right. Um, it is a hash collision would be two different um strings being hashed to the same string uh, same hash value i'm saying two exact same strings being collisioned into the same hash so and that's why they're yes. called dot pot files potentials potential collision i used a mathematical algorithm to calculate a hash from your dictionary file it matched the hash you were trying to crack from your recovered hashes guess what and thank you for that yes i didn't want to confuse everybody um because that is actually how you break encryption too, is to find two different strings that are hashed to the same value. So you're right. Thank you for pointing that out. Uh, do you have any passphrase specific word lists? Uh, which, yeah. So there's a couple. Um, crack station, crack station human readable. Um, BHS has has curated our own. That is the result of the sealer logs. So um, and that's a live thing. So it just it grows over time. It's massive. I can't even understand how massive it is at this point. It's, I think. I want to say it's gigabytes in size, maybe 30 gigabytes or something in size. So it's, it's all raw text. So it's it's huge. Yeah. And then you just use um, masks on top of that. So yeah, huge. All right. Moving on. Um, <laughs> unpatched software and web app components. This is an interesting one. Uh, I don't. Yeah. So we'll talk very briefly about things like running an outdated version of jQuery. Um, could be a problem if you use the specific functions in that jQuery package that's vulnerable. But that doesn't happen very often. More likely what's happening is you're running something like an, un, uh, an unsupported or unpatched version of Windows, or maybe Linux, or maybe even Mac that has vulnerabilities. Now, if you're in the unsupported area, the problem with that is, generally speaking, if a zero day comes out that affects all of those products, it won't be patched for those unsupported products. Now, there's been some scenarios where the zero day is so bad that the vendor um, um, comes so back comes and back unlocks and, their end of life. In in terms of goodwill, we'll go back and and create a patch for it. You know, we saw that with XP, and that's good, but we don't want to rely on that. Now, we also have had discussions at organizations like hospitals that might have a MRI that has an embedded XP machine, and that MRI machine has maybe a twenty year life cycle where they're going to depreciate that machine for twenty years, and they can't just replace it because of the cost of it. That happens right and when you look at that perspective there's other mitigating controls for that but network segmentation yep yeah, exactly yeah but what we saw is that with unpatched software it could lead us to an initial foothold in an organization um, especially for web application servers i don't want to pick on oracle or apache but their web application servers are amazing in terms of their utility but once you get into the scenario of them being uh unpatched not even just unsupported but unpatched you can have zero days that come out on those they don't have to be zero days you can have uh vulnerabilities that are have that are not uh patched because those web application servers might be embedded in a different product uh and consequently if that vendor does not update their product and does not update the embedded piece inside that product you'll never get it and consequently you're running this this web application server that it's vulnerable. It lets us write in, but you can't do anything about it because your vendor didn't update, right? So it's it's multifaceted here, but the key thing is to keep your products updated. You know, have an asset list that has all of your assets on it, what version of software is installed, not just the OS, but the software is included. If you've never run a uh, Nessus authenticated scan on a system, boy, let me tell you, you're, you're in for a wild ride about update policies because it will find every application on there that's not updated to the most recent version, and it's massive. It's a very, very uh, long report to read through there. So these, uh, let's let's clarify some of these 
attacks or some of these risks. Here we have overlap pretty frequently in the unpatched and unsupported software realm. So if we're looking at systems, we try not to duplicate in our reporting. So we'll end up reporting, hey, you've got a 2008 R2. We verified it was live. So that's unsupported software versus this jQuery library that we found that was unpatched versus you know a web app component exposed on the external network all of these things combined gave us you know a pretty serious problem across industry and now transitioning into the defense slide we're going to talk about go ahead and switch we're going to talk about how to address this from the perspective of someone who just gets to tell you how to clean up the kitchen after we destroyed all the dishes enforce patching standards right that sounds so simple and it's a policy statement that says we're going to implement and enforce patching standards on all our systems. However, it's a little bit more difficult to actually do that. So in the medium, we need a better procedure. We need to implement and improve inventory controls. So when you're looking at your inventory, do you know what systems you have? Do you have some acquisition process that's tracking serial numbers? And when we get into the actual implementation of a program to fix this problem, this is incredibly difficult. And if you go back and look at the critical security controls, I think it was one through 25 years ago, who knows what it is now? Probably someone on here could post this in a minute. The critical security controls were the most abandoned uh, ISO program or improvement program for security because of inventory and how hard it is. Every acquisition your organization makes needs a point of contact. Something comes into your environment, it is tracked, it is assigned to someone. Those systems are patched, they're rolled out, Vendor passwords are rotated, and then if it's my responsibility, Kent gets to go verify my work. We register the warranty on those products. That email inbound on every security notification goes somewhere meaningful. And then we actually have to treat that as high priority. So implementing policy is easy. Implement a better policy. That goes nowhere almost every single time. Guess what, though? There's no easy button for this. It is, an FTE. It is at least one FTE. It doesn't matter how big your organization is, it's an FTE. It absolutely is. Unless you're like, you know, under maybe 50 employees, even then it probably is. It is very difficult to do. And yeah, there's going to be software out there that makes it easier, but I guarantee you that software still needs someone to administer it. And you still need the, someone to actually physically touch the device to know its condition, right? Thank you. Yes. Critical security controls is 18 now. And I guarantee you that inventory should be somewhere in the top four or five. And it's still, it is so challenging to implement this properly, to do it well. Think about exposing a bunch of systems and services to your internet. It, it, you're running a bunch of IP addresses. You've got load balancers here. You've got stuff in the cloud. Your external surface now spans the globe. Someone should still be responsible for every exposure you have as a service. Someone needs to be assigned tracking. Someone needs to be assigned the responsibility of maintaining the back end of that service. What is behind it? Is it patched? Is it running current TLS? Mm -hmm. Is the application vulnerable? Has it been pen tested? Do we see things that happen when uh, we should, right? We know the internet is nothing but noise these days and everything that gets exposed to the internet gets scanned in a couple of minutes. But how do we improve? How do we get better at knowing what to look at? You just, you have this really challenging situation where we're going to come in and tell you everything is broken and everything looks terrible and we can break into all these systems. You didn't see it on an external test. And then we tell you to do these things. You look around. I'm already buried. My plate's full. I'm short staffed. This is tough. This is really tough. One that gets missed here uh, often is after you've created this inventory, hopefully you've got one for hardware and one for software, your software inventory list, find all the vendors, Go to those vendors and this sucks yes. go sign up for their newsletters every single one of them sign up to say when you have a vulnerability or a new new yes. software release i want to know about it probably create a generic mailbox for that uh because it's going to be it's very very spammy but you need that type of notification and it's going to be a notification that comes through that unfortunately someone has to look at but it, you'll catch those things as they come through all right next somebody up. was waiting for this slide okay. Ken. someone was someone, someone was, waiting. was waiting so if you look at this this is one of those things where we can go from zero to credentialed access in a matter of minutes sometimes, a couple hours, push around, maybe your organization's sturdy and we have to create LNK files and drop them on a share before we get our first cred. But if you're not doing these basic things, it kind of points back to the same thing we report with weak password policy. You probably got some cultural issues 
about risk and maybe a, a lack of awareness. So this one was only reported as medium 9% of the time, which tells me there were other mitigating yeah. controls. But anyway, Kent, where do you want to take this one? Well, talking a little bit high level, kind of what's the the the, the risk vector here? Um, I get dropped on a network. Um, I might run something like Responder and I got a cred. And what do I do with that cred? Well, you know, uh, and specifically not a username password, but a username hash. If I have that combination, what do I do with it? And something I might want to do is just take it and relay it across a bunch of other systems. And when I say relay, I mean, take that credential, that username and just say, I'm going to try to authenticate to all these systems with it and see what happens. Uh, if you have SMB and LDAP signing enabled, ideally what will happen is um, the, the source of my authentication attempt, me, the, the attacker, is not going to be known on that system. So effectively, the recipient system, the authentication system on that is going to be like, I don't know who you are, I'm not going to trust you. That's what you want to have happen. The other scenario here is that you don't have it signed. And when you are allowing these services to run unsigned, it means that when I relay that credential attempt, it's going to be treated just like a username and password, and it's going to be treated just as though I am the person that I say I am when I try to do that authentication. So it's kind of interesting um, from that perspective. Let's talk a little bit. I, I saw something breeze yeah. by here, oh. and it, it's, it's funny. So I'm going to tell us a little side note here. I had a roommate in college. And we used to sign each other up for things, <laughs> including like the rascal. Like you would, you would when it used to be on television, you'd call in and like, "Hey, I'm interested in rascals. Could I? Could you sign me up for that?" And you'd sign your roommate up. This guy saying, "Well, maybe we should spam our coworkers yeah. with vendor notifications." Okay, so <laughs> consider this: um, rascals did not go and authenticate that Jordan was not his roommate. Right? That's the signing we're talking about. All right. Uh, defenses here. Um, it's so real talking. The, the technical defenses are just to enable these features um, on the systems that you operate. Typically, Active Directory. You have group policy is the easiest way to do that. Uh, sure, you can get into. To yeah, here's yourself. the the strategy. Here is simple in that we say it's easy to fix this thing, but we can't ever <laughs> say that. No. It's, there's it's organizational. Hard. Like I'm going to keep using the word organizational culture. Like it is really challenging to implement change at some organizations. And so when we say it's easy to fix this, you just deploy good policy, you set it and forget it. <laughs> Tell that to good the luck. Yeah, yeah, good thanks. luck. Like I wish you the best, but right. I'm telling you it's something you need to get done. So this actually leads more to about protocol management than anything else. If you've got these protocols in your environment, do you know that you do? No one should be surprised about SMB and LDAP. I run Active Directory. I don't use SMB and LDAP. If you've ever heard that, then stop, maybe find a different uh, AD admin, maybe find an MCSE. Anyways, let's go on. Let's talk about uh, MFA. Now, never ends with you. It never ends. Uh, MFA is interesting. I think we see we've started calling out um, when we do an external pen test now. If we find a web service that has a username and, username and password field, um, we ask for a credential. We ask our customer, hey, can you give us a valid credential for this system? Um, sometimes I do, sometimes I don't. It kind of depends on how um, how much work that is for them. But what we do is we test that that platform to see if there was MFA enabled on there. And if it's not enabled, it's an immediate finding for us. Uh, and the reason why is we've already talked about stealer logs. We've already talked about these places that we can get credentials from. We've already talked about winter 2024, winter 2024 explanation port being a terrible password, but it's used. If you've got systems that are externally exposed, not having MFA, it's a problem. And the reason it's a problem is because it enables the ability for those passwords sprays and it just lets someone write in if they've got a valid credential. Yeah, and I would I would say to Loki here, it's it's funny to us and there's humor in it, but it is so difficult sometimes to get these conversations across the table. You know this as well as any of us. Your statement is incredibly accurate. It's just we have to have some kind of humor or we will go crazy, just absolutely crazy. Stay here for one second. Yep. I am telling you, this is the thing I was shocked about most in all of the data sets. We're still sitting at 40% of our external tests having a lack of MFA. 40% of networks did not have MFA. Yeah. And when you chain together a low priority finding like information leakage and breach, a weak password policy as medium, you get a critical or a high like this. It's it's shocking to me that we are still dealing with a lack of multi-factor authentication. 
So how do you fix it? Well, okay, technically speaking, know everything that's on an external perimeter. And if you've got web services on there, make sure they have MFA. Different point, um, what's on your external interfaces? What's on your external perimeter? And we see the weirdest things on external perimeters. Um, you know, I've seen uh, DNA repositories that are just like a single passphrase to get in. And it's very strange. Um, and you should question everything, I guess. You know, I look at it from the perspective of do a Nessa scan on your external interface, find the web services, find all the services, go through every, every one, every single one, and justify why it's exposed, every single one. After you do that, classify it, figure out who the point of contact is, make sure it's MFA enabled. Great job for an intern to oh, yeah. spend $10 on a digital ocean node for 30 days and give an intern and map, allow say. everything. Let them figure out what what's out there about your organization. I guarantee you they're going to find something you don't know. I was I was afraid. Make sure you pay your interns more than ten dollars. <laughs> yes, a digital ocean note is approximately <laughs> ten to twelve dollars a month. Uh, after you've gone through and got that inventory inventory asset control of those external ports of those external services, reduce it as much as possible. Figure out what you don't need. All right. Uh, if you're not familiar with LMNR, can we uh, skip this one? No, I'm joking. Let's go go to Google right now, search LMNR. Um, I'm sure there's plenty of there. Maybe one of the top posts, you'll find some good information. Here's the thing, we still see it all the time. We're seeing it less, which is good. Um, I want to just preface this. It's a network poisoning attack. Essentially, the screenshot does a really great thing here. Um, because of lack of authentication or authorization on layer two, you essentially, I can be on a network and say, hey, John, are you there? And then Sierra's in the middle, and because she's between me, John and I, she can say, "Here, I'm John, right here." Uh, and John's, you know, in the corner there, saying, "I'm here." The reality of what LMR looks like and multicast and NBNS poisoning is that I'm not going to talk to John because he's too far away. And Sierra's response got to me quicker, so I'm going to talk to Sierra as though she is John. Now the attack chain looks like Sierra. When I go to talk to her, she says, "Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm sure you're Kent, but I'd like you to submit me your credentials so that I know that you're Kent." Um, and there you go. That's how you get the credential. That is the big threat vector here, uh, essentially, is, is the ability to um, do that name poisoning on layer two. So it's very interesting. Let's talk about how to prevent it. Um, it's not hard. It's group policy. Uh, also, if it's Linux, you can you can do so. NBNS is a little more challenging, but I think they fixed this in Windows 11. And, okay. And 2022. Strategically speaking, though, know what's operating in your environment, understand your network stack, have a network engineer that does it, know how to use Wireshark. Um, but strategically, I'm saying get the groups that, that understand that and don't run protocols that you're not familiar with and don't understand how they work. And obviously, you know, follow BHIS. We talk about this quite often. Yep. This one's tiring. And this one's cool, too. This is new and uh, not new. This is new ish. Uh, our use of it has improved over time as this these tactics and techniques have. Yeah, we saw improved. the trend. There's a trend. Yeah. At the beginning of the year, we didn't have a lot of this. By the end of the year, we were doing this on a lot of engagements. Yeah. Uh, so essentially, I'm going to kind of just wrap this really quick. It's uh, essentially, if I'm a local user on a workstation, I can get that workstation to authenticate to something else that I control. The system itself, not me as the user, but the system can authenticate to a different uh, computer that I control. And in that process, I get that system's credential, right? And that's kind of the, the, the process here. Now, sometimes that system uh, is a domain controller, which means I'm not just getting any system credential, I'm getting the domain controller system credential, which is a pretty clear path to DA. Uh, so be aware of that. There are um, the strategies for this are, are interesting. You can't just like disable it. Like it's, it's almost a feature and it's not it, it's it, the reality of it is it's probably bugs in code or it's it's uh things that we didn't have foresight into when code was written but essentially there's no fix for this eventually they'll be patched but those coercions um sometimes are necessary just for authentication to work properly as it's built today for those protocols to work so we're talking about east-west traffic inspection it's no longer enough to look at traffic that's just leaving your environment you actually need to look at internal that's networks going across Firewalls on workstations, yeah. Um, servers, yeah. The reality of it is, though, you really need to do work on monitoring for this. It's a difficult one to catch right now. It's going to get better. All right, ADCS. We're, this is not, oh man, this is tough. Okay, Active Directory uh, Certificate Services is huge. Um, we have seen for the last two years now how this becomes a 
compromise. And the reason is it's just misconfigured. DA as a service. It's DA as a service. So essentially, ADCS, uh, it's an authority that you can create credential or sorry, certificates with, uh, and those certificates can be signed, they can be revoked. Um, you can use ADCS to do things like um, as part of your radius authentication package, in which case you would create a certificate template that users can use to authenticate against and create a certificate with their name on it. If you create that certificate incorrectly, you can do things like allow any user to authenticate as any user. Now, it's not difficult to see why that'd be a problem. A domain level user, a domain user level could just easily create a certificate that has a subject alternative name, someone else impersonate um, a different user, typically the administrator account or a domain admin. Uh, and that's a very quick and effective uh, escalation. The process for cleaning this up, it's interesting, the tools uh, that you use to clean it or to identify it are the same tools that you use to attack it, uh, which is nice when that happens. Uh, so clean up your templates, do the audit, run certify, run certify, find those vulnerable templates, just clean them up. And you know, some of those, if you've got a template that's like, well, wait, that's our phone system. Okay, now you need to go back to your vendor and say, hey, I've got this template. Can you provide me the, the installation documents? Because it's possible that the installation documents, when whoever was uh, running the install for it and creating that certificate template, missed a checkbox. Because the path to escalation on ADCS is a, is a little checkbox, one checkbox. That's mm -hmm. it. So it's it's very easy to miss. And we see it a lot because of how easy it was to miss. Uh, I'm suspecting that newer versions of Windows will make that much more difficult to create vulnerable templates. All right. This is combo combo. This, this is our brutal. Yeah, this one is. So this is our, our last risk we're going to talk about. Uh, and it's it's almost a combination of all of them. And it is. I definitely combine these in the data sets. And that's because we find credentials everywhere now or systems that are lacking credentials and, and are somehow like a printer integrated with LDAP. And we can pull a config file and crack a cheesy little LDAP oh, hash and then use that oh. for ADCS. Uh, I think that was your story I just stole. Yeah or the password expiration exceptions. You've got uh, Kerberosable accounts with 12 year old passwords. Guess what? They're probably weak. We crack those, right? So we're working our way back into the chain. Password reuse, something shows up in Steeler logs. We steal that, we guess it, it works. Widespread administrator accounts. We get a SAM table off a box. We move around laterally across the entire network. And code, right? .NET code is, is a really interesting place to look these days. So we've been spending a lot of time in DNSpy, and uh, Phil likes another another tool. I can't remember the name of it, but I'm a DN Spy fan. And, and then we find code uh, credentials in code and automation routines. So DevOps and other you know CI/CD pipelines, Azure deployments. That's an interesting and, one. In AWS, all the different places and automation that you can have credentials stored. We see it all the time. We'll do an AWS audit and we'll find credentials stored. And uh, user interface, user data in EC2 instances. We see it in CloudFormation. We see it in Lambdas. We see it all over the place. And it's it's not that there's no feature to mitigate this. It's it's Secrets Manager and KMS and AWS. It's like it's it's built in. It's there. It's just a process of you know when you develop, if you don't develop with that secure formation in mind, um, you end up with things like clear text credentials and source code. And it's easy to to, to mitigate at the source and you first do it if you've got an application that's been running for 20 years um, man it's scary to go change that source code off of a off of a uh, hard-coded password because you don't know you just don't know what'll happen and is there a doctor in the house <laughs> let's talk but you'll notice there's no defenses slide for this um because we we kind of said, we want to pose these questions to the doctor so if you could join us and, and bring it up let's let's do this can't, why does it feel like we're doomed right now? It, it, because so many, our, so many of our tests end with um, what we say is a simulated compromise or a compromise. And it, it's scary that it's so often, like I think about it from the perspective of like, we know that the entire internet is being attacked all the time, but what we're doing is, is generally targeted attacks. And the reality of it is it's scary how often that, you know, our customers right now are um, not getting attacked, not because uh, they're not getting compromised, not because they weren't vulnerable, but because it's hasn't, there's been no target for them yet. And that's, that's a scary thing. I don't know if he's going to join or maybe it's me and I just, I'm know. here. Oh, oh, he's here. Okay. Uh, yeah, Address I'm the... sorry. I can see you guys. Maybe you can't see me. I'm, I'm yeah, no worries. the call's coming from inside the house. 
<laughs> All right. So how does how does an organization that has limited resources, how do they they start with this? Like where do they they gotta get funding, you know? And how does that start? Yeah. Okay. So first off, uh, and just so everybody knows, hi, I'm Jerry, uh, InfoSec guy and uh, a big, huge GRC dork. So uh, I, I love this conversation. I, I love uh, uh, rubbing elbows with uh, red teamers and pen testers so I can uh, you know, play one on TV. So as far as orgs that don't have a lot of money, the thing is, you got to be mindful that it doesn't cost anything to configure the things you already own. It doesn't cost anything to have a conversation with the business and change their mindset, right? There's no, there's no shiny, you know, yellow cheese, Swiss cheese looking server rack. If you guys, you guys are older, you remember when Google had that, you could like rack and stack at your own place. There's no, there's no shiny bobble that you throw into the rack that's going to, you know, basically change culture. I know you guys talked a lot about culture and about having, you know, running your head into these uh, business people. What I would argue and I find highly successful is relating it both to money, because that's what the business typically speaks, but also making it personalized, right? Like, listen, executive, like, it's great, it's great, but, you know, multi fact, like, let me help you not get robbed. Like, multi factor authentication makes it so when somebody breaks into your bank account, they don't just get in and take your money. They, this will help you by doing this, like, kind of relaying why the why behind the ask really, instead of like, oh, like this is terrible. Like I'm elite hacker. I just kicked a mud hole in the side of your business. I'm epic, you suck. Like it, it's more about like, you know, like making it almost bite sized right? Like you got to spoon feed these, these individuals because they honestly don't care about technology or cyber. They care about making money and, you know, straight cash homie, right? Straight cash homie. Using my soundboard here. So for me, limited to no resources, take advantage of all the things that you've already paid for and already have. Turn off all the crap that you don't actually need. Um, and then, I, you know, you had mentioned end of life stuff. Uh, I think that that's equally uh, valuable to start getting into budget cycles and talking about, hey, we need to like focus on getting off of 2008 R2 or focus getting off of whatever, you know, Zixel device we're using nowadays um, and, and really start conveying that. So anyways, hopefully that All answers right. the question for no it's budget. Perfect. Deb said no politics, but I'm swinging. Will our legislators ever step up and push meaningful regulation? Help small, medium business with cybersecurity is what I'm asking. Uh, in what capacity? Providing public resources for them to leverage? I don't know. I, I don't so, know. So, I mean, I, I would I would say this in, in response to that. It, it the, yes, but it's still not enough because CISA offers a boatload of free opportunities, free resources, free vulnerability scanning, free, you know, you can call this number if you get ransomware and stuff like that. And people don't know about it. They don't know how to take advantage of it. They feel intimidated because it's a, you know, five person business. They're all doing things. Maybe they outsourced IT. Maybe it was like their 20 year old son who's like home from college that set them, you know, like set it up initially and went off and did Is that. Is it meaningful though? Is what meaningful? What the like? Is, the is, are, are these resources available meaningful? Do they do they provide value? So, if you have no resources, is this useful to you? Okay, so the one gap that I would uh, that I would argue there's a gap here. The the resources are available, but you do need a human to consume the resources and do something logical with it. So a business owner. Uh, you know, like I, I own a business and like when I look at like finance and accounting stuff, I can Google all the things, but when I'm looking at it, I, I'm like, what do I do with it? I don't know what to do with this. So I think the same thing is happening where these resources are made available to businesses to help secure themselves, to like raise the tide for everybody. And they look at it and it's just overwhelming. They get, you know, basically apathetic and they're like, forget it. Like, why should I spend one hour working on securing if if I can't do all, you know, like say it's going to take 10 hours to implement all the best practices. If I can't do all of them, then what's the what's the value in doing one of them? You and I know that there's value at least in, you know, something, but I feel like that's what's happening. And that's the gap is that you need, you do need a practitioner or somebody to take that information and be the conduit into the business. All right, we got a couple more slides to buzz through, so we're gonna do it super quick because they were uh, someone asked for it. Uh, we did something similar last year, so if you're interested, screenshot. We're not going to talk about it. It's hey, in the slides. <laughs> how your CISO prevented compromise in 2024? Screenshot it if you want to know more about it. We'll talk more about it later. And finally, 
Um, we've reached the end of our presentation. The dot. On the dot. Thank you, doctor. Truly amazing. Thank you. Ooh. We've got a couple of classes out. Our next class, depending on the enterprise, that is Active Directory Focus is March 14th through the 15th. That is virtual. We don't yet have one for Applied Purple Teaming. We are still in the process of reworking Applied Purple Teaming, updating it, making it new. Uh, that'll be a new class coming out. So that one's not quite available yet, but we'll be at the most offensive con that ever offensive. All right. Well done, guys. I was going to cut you off and write it too. So good job. Oh, we knew you were. <laughs> yes, we did. <laughs> kindly you know nicely as as one does for sure but, but thanks guys you guys amazing i love when the two of you present together your report is obviously very infectious and you I did it a, a lot of joy and fun this topic i know gets y'all riled up and you get you get mad <laughs> so i don't know about mad i'm not mad i'm, mad. I'm, I'm not mad it keeps us in business uh, truly sure I'll, I'll have, I, I have a whole host of like follow-up questions. I'll have to have you guys oh. <laughs> on my street. Like a total nerd. I took notes. And uh will you I got be willing to share that with the will you be willing to share your notes with the class, please? <laughs> yes, please feel free. Yeah. Questions if we didn't if um you didn't get a chance to ask your question, now's the time. And we'll stick around here for probably like five to ten more minutes and answer them. So and Jerry swing while we're waiting for Yeah. Uh, so I mean, uh, just this this is kind of a uh softball question but i'm really curious from your perspective as practitioners so you had mentioned you walk into a business and external facing assets don't have mfa obviously that's disgusting right that's just like straight up gross two out of five <laughs> we don't Not say all that, that though <laughs> two out of five okay two out of i'm sorry okay you know what I, you yeah. know what i mean like just any yeah. anything above zero is gross so but what i'm curious do you guys go one step further and weigh the mfa um that they're actually using so like if sms is the only option i say implement it because it's better than nothing but obviously um you know like the rotating six digit pin is is better than mss uh sms hardware yubikey is better than uh software so i'm just curious do you guys give give different criticalities or different responses based on what mfa is selected with respect to the application that it's protecting access from in some regards but we, we just had a customer come to us and I think Corey's probably on this test because he's one of our, like the tip of the spear. We had a customer come to us and they want us to do SIM swapping attacks. They want us to demonstrate what that looks like from a provider perspective, how easy it is to socially engineer anyone these days, whether it's a Verizon help desk employee working on a SIM swap or, you know, a help desk resetting a password for us. So yeah, I, I think I would wait almost similar to you right hardware is the best you can't you cannot beat a yeah. yubikey uh fingerprint yubikeys now are amazing i don't you, know you do start talking about that jordan always have this this threshold right and it starts with being very permissive permissive Permi uh, promiscuous permissiveness <laughs> and yeah. paralyzing paranoia right so, you got two sides of a scale where are you on the scale if you don't have mfa we all do business right? in the middle yeah so we all do business in the middle and there is a threshold for which uh, um and any organization can take right in terms of, of their appetite for risk and the reality of it is as you get into those more um, complex and stronger mfa um, capabilities it, it also becomes i don't say more expensive but in a way it is it might not be capital necessarily but in the perspective of i know how to use sms for mfa but this dongle you gave me like i don't so i have to carry this around with me all the time and there's there's you know some friction there that has to be dealt with that's different and also from give the example of a bank where you're, the mfa is not about your employees but about your customers you're not going to be issuing yubikeys for all of your bank or customers right and i actually i mean like wells fargo used to have the, the rsa dongles you, they were like five bucks and that's how they secured their services before you know one-time tokens that were a thing and, and one more 12 bank. second side note we had a guy I, I i'm not going to name names who wrote a python runner to clone and then accept login credentials and then would run YubiKey pastes into the application, authenticate on the back end, present the same thing to the user to demonstrate YubiKey bypass. It doesn't, you know, there's always a way around. Yeah. Depending yeah. on how much effort you want to put into it. I, I mean, I, I can keep going. I don't know. I don't want to. Go ahead, please. Yeah. As yeah, long as okay. stops this. 
I don't want to squash uh, chat if they're asking questions, but yeah, I mean, I, I always just to kind of parallel what you guys are saying, one kind of mental construct that I used to convey to non practitioners is a straight line similar to you, like you said, permissive and, and hardcore paranoid, but I, I like to say usable and secure, right? And like the more, yeah. you, the more usable you make it, the less secure it is. And we're going to add friction and business case, is somewhere in the middle and some lean to the left, some lean to the right. Yeah. Sometimes you get lucky and you, you get a win-win, but uh, what, what are your thoughts? I mean, okay. So here's another one. Federated authentication has a control. I like it because when you shut off access, you know, for a fact, you've cut off access to all the cloud systems and all the other nonsense. Also single point of failure for access. Where do you, where do you advise uh, uh, clients on federated authentication? So this is probably a place that we don't eat a lot of our own dog food. Um, because we're going to say, yeah, federated services are great in terms of authentication and, you know, identity management. It's excellent when you pair that with something like device management as well. So your identity management is not just the person with their credential and their MFA token, but also like device. And then you start talking about zero trust, right? Where you're not just, um, talking about geographic locations, but the actual device is all of our software that needs to be, is EDR enabled? Is it updated? You know, the software inspection before you can use services that are out there. Um, so pairing that that federation with something else is excellent security in, in layers, right? I said BHS doesn't you know always um, eat our own dog food. An example I can give is we SSH everywhere, and our SSH is typically not federated. Um, we've got uh, and we don't use password based auth, obviously, but we do have you know keys that we use, and every employee has their own key that we use. But that's we've got scripts and we use Ansible so that when we need to remove someone off of those systems. Um, it's mostly automated, but you're right. You have to have an inventory control list of all of those services and validate that a system was updated to re with removals or additions as the, as needed. So it's just, it kind of comes from the perspective of it is single point of failure. Um, I would probably say at this point, do we trust Microsoft? Do we trust G Suites? And um, if, if we don't trust them, uh, who can we trust? I, I don't know. We're going to do it. All. Here's the thing. If you can't trust them, are you sure you can trust yourself to do it better? And that's kind of a, <laughs> that's interesting. you get into really, interesting. really difficult assumptions when you yeah. go down that path. So. I love it. Yeah. And you had mentioned you had touted the, the, the benefits of password vaults. I'm a huge password vault guy. Um, I do think that biggest challenge personally, this is a hot take, if you will. Um, the biggest challenge to password vault adoption is the initial onboarding. I feel like once you get on and you show them like right click here or just look in your phone here, it becomes very seamless, even to the fact of unbelievable benefit. I can speak to an iPhone where you can replace the existing password manager with the you know Bitwarden. And now like when you log into apps on your phone, you can just use your face to push through and push your Bitwarden credentials. So I would actually say that the onboarding is the pain point, but once you've got it, I actually think it's a better user experience. I don't know how to solve for the onboarding piece of it. I wish there was like a you know AOL disk that they used to send back in the day. You could just pop it in and it would do all the magic for you and you'd be online and getting your mail. Yeah. You know, there's a risk on the other side of this that we are familiar with. Um, year ago, two years ago, we made a very quick move from a deployed uh, uh, um, password that we last used, password manager that we last used, um, to something else. Um, and it was because of, of not seamless, <laughs> not no. seamless at all. And it was something that was the result of a compromise. So when we talk about those federated services, you're saying, you know, single point of failure. It is that that specific password manager had a single point of failure and we trusted them and we had to spend a lot of resources, mm -hmm. not necessarily money, but just the resources to move off of that system quickly because it was compromised to a different system was really really difficult for us and challenging and it would have been for anyone and we also know that we're not the only ones that you know made that pivot very quickly too and um, i think lots of other password manager companies have probably uh profited from that but the type of resources you're talking about almost universally yeah. equal money it is it's it's a risk that doesn't get talked about often until you're faced with it and you have to very quickly pivot so that's the other side of that token is on those single points of failure you know you have to be up to date on it and ugh, you really have to trust those vendors and do vendor selection as best you can and you know have a, a vetted process for your vendors yeah yeah I, can i can i weigh in on that too or we're, yeah. we're pivoting off now i don't know George, <laughs> something. 
So, I mean, what you guys are talking about for those in chat, I'm sure many of you heard this term, but if you have vendor lock in is this term and it's incredibly easy to get on board and it is unbelievably painful, expensive, time consuming, frustrating to get off of the platform. And mm -hmm. again, just being a super GRC guy here, um, you know, I'm hacking your uh, security questionnaires like doing vendor selection is so vitally important. I've seen it a million times maybe hyperbolically speaking, I've seen it a million times where, hey, we're, we're going to get a new service or a new feature or whatever. And the CEO is like, I play golf with the CEO of this. Let's go there. And it's like, that doesn't, that's not a good move. Like we should definitely do a bake off. We should make sure we have what requirements we need. We should check the boxes. And unfortunately, no one really does that correctly all the time. And it ends up, you get on board with a vendor that's not the best, it, and I'm saying like a breach aside, right? It could be the best one they get breached. Best yet. sales, best marketing though. <laughs> yeah, I know, but that's that's my problem. It's like people don't really put in to, they don't weigh the value of who wow. you select and get on with uh, as much as they should because it's all, you know, rainbows and unicorns until the second you got to rip everything out. And this, honestly, I think this is another reason why end of life systems, end of life software persist in environments because it's painful to transition out of it. Like 2008 R2, like you need to do a schema update to, to move off of it. And that like, that's like, oh, that's too hard. Let's, let's be vendor locked into 2008 R2. All right. Thank you. From, a, from a, okay, so I got to go to the accounting perspective on that too. About the time that you're depreciating a system to zero dollars is about the time you should get funding to replace it, right? Like that should be pretty because it should be a consistent state. You shouldn't be into a situation of oh no, I need to buy you know 100 computers. It's like no, you you knew this was happening right here because accounting had depreciated that thing to zero. It's now time to depreciate it, get it you know off to um, off the books and recycle recycled and get a replacement for it whatever that time period looks like and i know it doesn't always need to be based off accounting because sometimes you want to depreciate it immediately just because you get the tax but the point is that have some sort of cycle for that so after four years that system is no and servers are going to last more than four years but you know a, a laptop in the field four years it might actually be at the point that it needs to be replaced anyway consider those things um here's my complaint about the process of vendor as you say bake-off the email you get afterward the phone calls that you get afterward mm -hmm. if you went a different direction even telling these vendors we chose a different product okay. we don't want to hear from you anymore and yeah. being unable to remove them from your radar forever they keep calling they keep blowing up my you, inbox so here's the thing. you almost have to because okay so those that have followed us for a long time know that at one point we were we were on g suites um and we're not anymore. I talked about Microsoft's, right? So you, now you know. You can go look at our MX records, figure it out. It doesn't matter. The point is um, that it happened. But the other point is that we're still G Suite's customers because once you're there, you can't you can't just my, you you now have both. Mm -hmm. You will never. You want to use both. YouTube? Oh, you better be on G Suite. <laughs> yeah, or so, it's not even G Suite's anymore. What is it? Is it uh, G Cloud? Uh, something else now. Uh, it's Google. Anyway, Google. What okay, else? Well, Are I'm we out of time? Well, I mean, we're out of time, but it's still fun to listen to you guys rant. They really want you to talk about privileged identity management. Oh, I really like that on Azure, the way they've implemented that. Basically, you can request temporary membership into groups. So I really like Azure's implementation of it. I'm not that familiar with it in any other context. So I've used this on engagements and I've been provisioned credentials in this way. And we do a little bit of that, like the PNP that I was playing with, temporary role, granted privilege yanked I, I love one recently um organization had one da and it was it was their pim by the cadet too they had a backup but they had one one da and any time that they needed like domain admin creds they had to like fill out those it was linked to i don't know service now or something it was linked to a, a service request and the service request used their pim and like there was full transparency to it so when someone needed access to something it created the account on the system and you could use it for that duration and that that account was tied to that service request like it was a one for one relationship so that's interesting from that perspective um and like that the pims give you the opportunity for that and maybe not just creating an account but there, there's these accounts that you can check out service accounts specifically so things like that that'd be pretty interesting from pims that the point of them is that you don't have to share passwords but you can use shared accounts because the pim is providing you the ability um, to do a check-in, check-out, still have non-repudiation, 
um, and still have full visibility into its use and have it also in a scenario that's like approvals. And so that's pretty interesting. Um, there's lots of, of capability there. Um, one more thing on that kind of goes back to that zero trust scenario where don't trust the network you're on. So services can be behind zero trust, which means start inspecting the laptop. We saw this 10 years ago when you had network access control devices, right? You had to install an agent on your computer and that agent would inspect the software. And if everything was okay, then it would put your computer into a different VLAN where you could actually get to the things, right? That kind of process secured it. Now we're kind of moving on to where we don't need those agents necessarily installed and we can inspect things like geographic locations um, and the... You're not going to get away with that. Yeah, you're, it's going to be another agent, like someone said here. Yeah. And that agent is going to need PowerShell under certain contexts. <laughs> and it's going to run in user space occasionally yeah. to do things. And that user land operation is going to require PowerShell too. So you're never going to be able to get rid of PowerShell. Sorry. Anyway, there's a great opportunity with BIMS. Awesome. Great <laughs> answer to a very simple question. <laughs> Um, I'm going to officially end us. This will just wrap us all up. Um, as always, if you need a pen test red team, we do GRC now. Just I would be remiss not to mention that. Uh, you know where to find us. Thanks, Kent and Jordan. And we'll still stick around. And I'm, I'm sure there are more questions. So, But this is officially the end of the webcast. All right. Good job, guys. Thank you so much. Yeah. Thanks, guys. Yeah. And again, you can stick around, ask more questions. We will be here for probably another five minutes. Yeah, I can I can do five more. more. Kent and Jordan, thanks for letting me like crash your stream. That was oh, awesome. Absolutely. It's a good collab. I like it. Yeah, it's what else you got? Um, everyone's just saying thank you, how awesome you are, all the fun stuff. Uh you don't have to go home. You can't stay here. Is my shirt wrinkly? Really? You, you, you look great. <laughs> you just now really been working that. out. <laughs> <laughs> well, I noticed I just didn't want to say you know, I bring attention to you. Uh, we are all over the place today. It's fine, it matches. Wife, yeah, I carry a bottle of Febreze with you to <laughs> wrinkles out. I wanted to ask you guys a question. It's it's even more appropriate that it's off stream uh, or off recording, right? We're still live, right? Obviously, we're still live. Yeah, yeah. I mean, um, Ryan yeah, might. So, yeah. So you had mentioned uh, getting like an intern to DigitalOcean and have them just kind of like basically look at your external network, right? To me, like external network is asset discovery, asset enumeration. Yeah, it, it's yep. it's it's absolutely ground zero, right? Like it, for me walking into a new business it's like mfa all the things and uh end user awareness training immediately and like i do it differently stop kent hold on i don't do it i don't do it like a powerpoint okay i do it look at that shade he was throwing you just with a look bro bro ken i want some shade it's all right i'm not gonna go down a rabbit hole and explain my my philosophical approach to end user awareness training but it is unbelievably impactful at reducing cyber risk. And the third thing I was about to say before you like basically shamed me is um, external network situation. So the what I wanna ask you is for smaller businesses, um, I always recommend Shodan Monitor. I think getting Shodan Monitor stood up and going is like a really great uh, exercise because it initializes and then it actually proactively maintains when you got, Carl throwing up IoT devices or WordPresses out of nowhere uh, on your external infrastructure um, so that you have that intern scanning and doing asset discovery. But do you recommend or do you ever see Shodan monitor being good? I'm not trying to shill for them because I don't have a relationship, but it's something that I use personally and something that I recommend. We tried it for a while at BHIS. Yeah. Um, Got a little unwieldy because we have so yeah. many random cloud assets we, and things changing constantly. We also noticed that the, the I don't want to call it, it's, it's not real, it's not quite real time. Um, we've had good luck. We've used Hacker Target, um, is one that we've been using, and that's pretty good. It just scans every day. So um, we give it our subnets, it scans every day, gives us a report. And then um, it doesn't give us a report, it gives us deltas. So that's helpful because we don't really want to know about what we already know. Um, so that's useful. I'm sure Shodan can do the same thing. Um, yeah, we we've we have a Shodan account. We you know it's set up, but we never look at it anymore because we've kind of pivoted off and used other things. Um, and you know we've got ones that uh, just monitor certificate transparency logs. So anytime a certificate that pops up with our domain, um, even if it's not something that we uh, are administering, we get aware of it. So if someone creates a self signed cert using our domain and puts it on the public internet, you know we'll we'll get an alert about it. So we we find things like that are useful, but um, they're also kind of noisy, so you kind of have to, the problem is you have to give someone the tools to hunt that stuff down when it's uh, alerted upon. Yeah, no, this is good. I never heard of Hacker Target before. I just brought it up. That looks, uh, that looks really good. 
Uh, and, and, you know, again, for like a small business that doesn't have like a dedicated. Yeah, it's, it's not cost prohibitive, right? Because yeah. the other side of that is to build a script and do it all yourself. But then you're you're dumping in dev time and uh, might be good for an intern. But, uh, you know, after that intern leaves and you're, you're left with a program that you don't know, you know, maybe all the, the unique things about. So using a third party service for that is fantastic. I love it. Um, now, just like to pivot for a second, like I, I'm still like rolling through this shade that you threw me here. So <laughs> I'm thinking like, you know, that scene from uh, A Few Good Men where Colonel Jessup's like, you need me on that wall. Like, Kent, you need me talking to the board about the risk. And like, you know, they're not doing technical hacky stuff. They need to be talk talked to in their own terms. So I I'm doing my part. We're all on the same team. No, absolutely. Not. Absolutely. Yeah, we had a debrief yesterday with an executive team, and it was uh, it's always eye opening to hear their perspective on things and their their interpretation of the risks as we present them. It's always a challenge to break out of our technical mindset and explaining things as implementers would go fix and instead switch over to you need a new program at your organization that tracks your inventory better. It's can, going to cost you money if you keep making the same mistakes. It's easy to do for for consulting calls for us. We can jump into that mode pretty easily. It's a lot and more I difficult. Both have business degrees, by the way. It's a lot more difficult to do on a webcast where you want to talk about both the technical aspects and mm -hmm. the executive level strategy. <laughs> um, to be able to kind of hop between that uh, back and forth, but yeah, absolutely. And no, I, no shade, shade, shade at all. Um, no shame at all. It is fantastic without without the ability to have governance. Um, none of this would matter because it'd all just be a train wreck anyway no one would do anything if they didn't have to right so <laughs> exactly. it absolutely needs that that guiding um leadership on it yeah and i didn't realize you guys had business degrees that that's phenomenal uh congratulations and i'm sure that helps you uh quite a bit um when you're servicing businesses I would it's a very different perspective yeah. so when when you read my strategic guidance kent's strategic guidance versus someone who has a computer science degree and then 27 sand certs their strategic guidance there is a clear delineation between the the communication strategy is trying to present in in that set in the executive summary don't, section of yeah, our report. Don't tell the CISO it's about, different. Don't tell the CISO about CBC ciphers. That they don't care. <laughs> They're not going to fix LLM and R either. It's not. They don't know what that is. They don't care. They never will. Yeah, I don't want them to. That'd be misuse of their time. <laughs> so funny. well, we could probably stay here and talk all day or listen to you talk all day. Um, but well, I think these are uh, sorry Harry Potter books over Harry here Potter with books, custom yeah. wraps. Yeah. Jerry, I'm a little disappointed you didn't use any of your sound effects. I, I gave you well, there was one. permission. Maybe you didn't hear him. I did the spicy. Um, you know, I did a Carl at one point. You know, I, I got my Rick Flair. You know, oh, that's okay. always nice. Can you do the patch it one? Oh, yeah, you gotta patch it. Oh, you gotta patch it. Yeah, that's me. <laughs> <I'm correct, sorry. laughs> we, got all sorts, we got all sorts. We got we got uh <laughs> when law enforcement is mentioned, when uh new people show up. When someone passes a cert, when someone gets breaks into the industry for the first time, we've been playing that one a lot more recently, which is always nice. Um, and then, you know, threat actors and stuff. Jerry, so. Listen, if, if you're on a webcast with us again, I authorize you to just throw out like, just, just whatever. <laughs> Please. It'd okay. be like a three hour webcast. <laughs> so you guys get distracted, no way. <laughs> All right, you got it, bud. Yeah, we've got, right. we've got some classics in here. We got some, this one, you know this one? Catch me outside. How about that? <laughs> <laughs> I'm sure does. I do. I do. That's why I show up. Is for the sound effects and Jerry too, for sure. For sure. Of course, of course. The All sound right. effects oh. gets me in there, though. Yeah. Amazing. Always a pleasure. To, Thank to you. The three hundred who your who have stuck around. I appreciate it. Yes. Yes. We're very thankful that Jerry showed us. And if you're still watching us, thank you so much for being here. We love this vicious cycle that we have. We can't get off of this crazy train if we wanted to, but we appreciate you guys very much. And we will see you next Thursday for another webcast. All right. Kill it with fire, Ryan. Bye, guys. I love you, but I'm hungry. So we're going to go with lunch. <laughs>